We're doing a series. We've started the secrets to success. So we've been learning different secrets, and this week we're going to learn a different secret, but it's all about you succeeding in life because God's will for you is that you be a success. God planned for none of us to be a failure. That's the enemy's plan, amen? And there's different things we can do to be a success, and today I'm going to talk about passion because uh, there's a power in passion. If you have a passion for something, you will succeed. It doesn't really matter what it is. It could be anything in this world. It could be anything. But if you're passionate for that item, you will fully succeed. And so passion is a very important thing. We're going to be talking about uh, how to reignite your passion because sometimes we were passionate and we lost our passion. And sometimes we don't know what our passion should be. But we all need a passion, amen? Amen. And so we're going to learn some great things about that. And it just so happens that this falls on the weekend that our teens and our youth ministry graduated from an eight-week course called Passion for Purity. And uh, we celebrated that Friday night. We had 32 young people go all the way through the course and uh, graduate. And their families were there, laid hands on them and prayed for them. And isn't it a positive thing in the world we live today for young people to get a passion for purity and holiness? Amen. That's such an awesome thing. And so proud of our youth ministry here. Next thing they're going to be doing is University for Financial Success and uh, teaching our kids how to succeed with their money, how to prevent getting way in debt and, and, and owing money for the rest of their lives, how to manage their money, how to grow money, how to... You know, that's something they ought to be teaching in school, but they don't teach that. They teach all kinds of other things, but uh, learning about money. So that's going to be a great program and looking forward to that. But let's get back to passion because that's where we find our success. One of the definitions for the word passion, it's a feeling of intense enthusiasm and a compelling desire towards someone or something. We've all had been enthusiastic about something at some time. And isn't it a wonderful feeling when you're full of enthusiasm? But isn't it a horrible thing when you lose your enthusiasm? And so we, God wants us to keep our enthusiasm. Matter of fact, I believe that you're not fully in the will of God until you're living life with a passion. And I believe the enemy has come to take from that. We'll be talking about that passage in the Bible where it talks about that uh, in a moment. But another definition I really liked, it says, passion, a fire that burns within, brings pleasure and joy to those who fuel it. So for your passion to come about and for your passion to remain, you have to feed it. You have to fuel it. Just like if you've ever built a campfire and you begin to lay little sticks on there and then bigger sticks and bigger sticks and bigger sticks and the fire begins to grow. It takes three things to cause a fire to happen. One is oxygen. Two is fuel. And the third one is heat. And so you start off with, why do you start off? What's the first thing you need to start with for a fire? Oxygen. And this is why a lot of people can't build a fire. Because they put a bunch of fuel there and then they try to add some heat and they can't get any oxygen. you got to have a space underneath that kindling for air and then you've got to bring the heat onto the fuel and that oxygen, it begins to build and then you've got to stack your logs in such a way that they don't collapse in on the fire and take away the oxygen. So those are the three things. How many have ever been camping? Yeah, you love camping, and you've gone out there to build a fire. I want to tell you a little story. When uh, A number of years ago, we used to do our leaders' retreat with our volunteers. Ever so often, we go someplace and do that. We used to do it in Cornville. Anybody know where Cornville is and near Sedona? And we go down there. There's a big camp. Uh, it's not there anymore, but we used to go down there. And uh, one of the events we would do in the evening is build a big bonfire. And then we'd just sit around the bonfire and roast marshmallows and just fellowship and share testimonies and worship God and sing and 
it was a great time. We'd always have a great time. But every time we'd go to do that, there would be a bunch of, well, kind of where I come from, we call them city slickers. And they would want to build a fire, but they couldn't build a fire. It's not as easy to build a fire as you think. You, it's an art. You really have to learn how to build a fire. If you know how to build a fire, you know what I'm talking about. But everybody thinks they can build a fire. Building a fire, it's not a good thing to use gasoline. But it will work. But you might be on fire too. You might be part of the fire. But anyway, I, I remember we had a bunch of guys. and One of them is Jeremy Frost. And I don't think he's in here, so I'll talk about it. He's with the youth. He's out there with the youth. Yeah. So he's kind of a sl city slicker back in those days. And I remember he was trying to build this fire and he couldn't get it going. Finally, my brother had to help him. So he'd get the fire going. But once we got the fire going, there was a couple other city slickers in our church. I won't mention their names. But they were going to put out the fire. Now, you would think anybody could put out a fire, right? But... Um, there was, this is up in Cornville, and, and there were some things I'd never seen before, like horses and stuff like that. And, um, but anyway, there's a, a water spigot, a hydrant, water, you know, like you put a hose on it, had a hose on it. And it wasn't the kind you just screw open like this, it was the kind you lift a lever up, right? How many are familiar with that? You just lift the lever up, and it's on full blast. You push the lever down, it's off. Well, these guys saw that lever, and they thought, well, this must be like that old-fashioned pump. You have to pump the water out. You know, you have to prime it and pump it out. So the one guy's got the hose to put on the fire, and the other guy over here, he's, he's pumping it like this, and the guy with his hose is going, the water's going like this, and he's going, pump faster, pump faster, pump faster, pump faster. <laughs> and me and Fred and some other guys, we fell down laughing. We just... <laughs> We, we couldn't even tell them what they were doing. And, uh, but anyway, camping's fun. And matter of fact, I hear our youth is going on a camping trip in the near future. If you're one of the young people here, you got to sign up for that because that's always a blast. They're going to have a great time up in the mountains and go camping. But anyway, you, you, I, I remember growing up. I grew up on a, a cattle ranch, and we lived in one place on the Mogollon Rim where we had no electricity. We had no running water, we had um, no indoor toilet, we had uh, no fire, uh, we, all our, our stove, like electricity or gas, our fire was a wood-burning stove. You'd have to build a fire inside this stove and then put logs in there, and mom would cook biscuits and pancakes or whatever she was cooking on that stove, and we had to heat with that stove, and so we got to where we learned how to build a fire. Uh, <coughs> Later on, we'd moved to Chino Valley, and our house there, uh, we had a fireplace, and then we had a wood-burning stove that heated the house. It was one of those iron stoves. How many ever had one of those? And man, they'll heat up that house, uh, you know, whether you're using coal or whether you're using wood. And so my job, every single morning, would to be get out of bed where it'd be snow on the ground outside, it'd be the middle of the winter, it'd be cold, and all the heat's gone because the fire goes out at night. You, just, you can't keep that fire burning all night without somebody feeding it. And so I would have to get that fire started because Tammy was not getting out of bed until that fire was gone. And she would, back then, she was stay-home mom, and so she fixed me my lunch and my breakfast, and that was kind of important. And so I'd have to get that fire going. I figured out a secret about those wood-burning stoves that I could get that complete, it was in our dining room, and heat it completely into the kitchen and into the living room like in less than five minutes. Uh, so what I do is I get in there at night, and the first thing you put in there is some newspaper. You, you wad up some newspaper, right? And then after that, I'd put a piece of black rubber inner tube. This is a secret. Yeah. And I'm going to tell you something. You put too much in there and you'll regret it. Yeah. <laughs> and I'd put that in there where it was propped up by some sticks, not smothering. You've got to be careful because that paper will catch right on and then that makes an air cavity and then it catches that rubber on. And then, I, you know, I'd have some small sticks. Uh, we called it kindling. 
And then we got railroad ties that are soaked in creosote. So old railroad ties. We'd cut those, split those, put them in there. I'd have it all met. All I had to do was light that paper, and you had these two vent holes out front, and you'd open those wide open, and within a few seconds, it would be shooting out balls of flame like this. I, sw I swear, that just that far, and that, that um, stove, that wood stove would be shaking like this. <laughs> so inner tube is the secret. But, any but anyway... So I learned a lot about building fire, and as I was thinking about passion, I began to think about, you know what, a passion in our life is like building a fire and keeping it going. Matter of fact, I want to use John 10.10. 10. This happens to be my favorite passage in the whole Bible, John 10.10. 10. This is my favorite passage because it tells us real quickly what the devil wants to do and what Jesus wants to do. And the devil wants to take away your passion. He wants to take away your fire. He wants to put your fire out in your marriage. He wants to put your fire out for life, period. He wants to take your passion away from serving God. He, that's what he's about, amen? He wants to give you a passion for evil. So he, he comes but to steal, to kill and destroy. But Jesus said, my purpose, his purpose, is to give them, which is you, a rich and satisfying life. I like that. A rich and satisfying life. So it is God's will for you to be happy. It is God's will for you to enjoy life, to have a passion for life. And so that's very important. So we're going to talk about areas that we need passion. And the first one I talk about is our relationship with God. We just got done worshiping God. I had a guy tell me many years ago, he came to me and he says, Pastor, I, I come to church a little bit late because... I don't really get anything out of worship. I just like to hear the word. Well, I got news for you. Worship is very, very important. The word is very, very important. But worship is where we get the fire going. That's where we get the fire going. It's so very, very important that when we're worshiping God, if you can come to the place where you just shut your mind out to everything in the world... And focus entirely upon the words and you singing those words to God. When you do that, you will recognize the Holy Spirit begin to embrace you. It is a real experience. It is something that is real. But you have to give yourself to worship. I, being the pastor, it's, it's always good if I greet people and say hi and be friendly and stuff like that. And, and uh, so, you know, I go outside and I'm saying hi to everybody, but secretly inside, I want to be in here at the beginning of worship. So I get a text, you know, from Kathy, she'll say, we're on the third song, and that means that you better hurry up and get back in here. And so I'll come back in, I'll stand over there, and I begin to worship God, and I begin to wish that all of a sudden, I just begin to wish that I've been in here for the whole worship service. Because there is something so powerful about God's presence. And you have to learn that when you worship God with all your heart, mind, and soul, that passion, that fire begins to burn. And it's worship that prepares us to receive the word. Amen? So, so it's very important. There's other things I do every day to get the passion of God. You have to... Look, the fire will go out. It'll go out every day. It's every day you've got to add fuel. You've got to add fuel. You've got to add fuel. And the more fuel you add and you keep that burning, the greater and deeper that passion is for God. And the reason some people struggle to live for God because they keep letting the fire go out. You can't just come to church on Sunday and help me give, give you a little bit of fire, and you go on Monday, you're just not, not doing anything. Amen? As soon as you get up, you got to get the fire going. I like to go to bed thinking about the Lord. You know, I, I read a lot, and, and, and as I'm reading, I'm getting tired, and I'm getting ready to go to bed. Uh, I, I put my book down, take my glasses off, turn out the light, and I like to just lay there and think about how good God is. How, how, he's such a good God, and, and before I know it, I'm in the most deep, restful sleep. But when I get up in the morning, the first thing I do, the first thing I do is go straight to Hebrews. 
Yeah, Hebrews. It, it says, it, 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 God even wrote a, a book, a whole book about coffee. It's called the book of Hebrews. And uh, so I go get my coffee. I make the coffee. That's the first thing. Matter of fact, Tammy will, I have to make her coffee every morning. If I miss making my wife coffee, she won't do my laundry. And I, that's a pretty good deal. So I like her doing the laundry. So, so I get up, I make the coffee. If I forget, I don't get up. Or she gets up before me and says, you ain't getting your laundry done this week. So I get right out there, get the coffee going. And then I like to take my coffee and I like to, I, I, use my, I used to use a Bible, I used to use devotional books, but now I got it all on version. So I like to go to version and do my daily devotional. And, and so I just, I read that devotional. Right now I'm doing a great devotional. It, it, matter of fact, if you're a friend of mine on version, you can actually see what I'm doing. And I'm doing this one right now. This is the most awesome I, I'm going to give it a five star. You can rate these devotionals after you're done. I always give them a, you know, some I give a one star, two star, three star, four or five. But this is a definite five. It's called the comeback. If you, and, and I did this study especially for this message. Because some of us need to make a comeback today, amen? You need to make a comeback today. It needs to be your comeback day. And this is a great devotional. It's done by Louis Giglio. And he is one of the, my favorite preachers of all preachers of all time. How many know, are familiar with Louis Giglio? I mean, this guy is powerful on. And uh, uh, some of the powerfulest messages I've ever heard. Hey, it just says, I got a friend request from, who sent me that friend request? Thank you. Thank you. But anyway, so you can follow along and you can see where I'm at, what I'm doing, what devotions I'm on and so forth. Some young guys come up to me and say, Pastor, there are three guys who are in the 9 o'clock service and they're sitting right here. They said, you know, what kind of devotionals do, is there for wanting to be an entrepreneur? We all three want to be an entrepreneur. And I said, well, type in entrepreneur under the search. They typed it in and there was... Dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of devotionals about being an entrepreneur. I mean, there's any subject you can think of in the world that you can think of. I guarantee you there's a devotional on you version. So anyway, I do my, and it doesn't take long. I, you know, I, I push the devotional part. And in this particular one, Louis comes on and he talks about something. And I watch the YouTube of him, and then I read what he has to say some more about it, going a little deeper, and then he puts a couple of scriptures. It doesn't take a lot of time, but I'm going to tell you, in that few moments when I take in the morning and do that, it begins to set my day to be passionate for the things of God, and I need to do that every day. My mom, she always does a devotional every day, and she's a little bit old-fashioned, in, in that she likes to use books and she writes down notes and she keeps a journal. There's nothing wrong with that. That's the way we always used to do it. I just use the phone now. And, and so the reason it, I'm saying this, there's no reason for us not to engage the Lord every day. It only takes me a few minutes. There's devotionals. You don't even have to read. It's all audio. You just push the audio and it talks to you. But we got to get some fuel in the fire. We gotta we gotta add some fuel. And and that's that's what you need to do. I mean, even if you're running late and on the way to work and you're driving, talk to Jesus, amen. Because it gets the fuel burning. So we need those kind of things. That's why, look, you might be lacking a little passion for God if it's a struggle to get you to church. Church ought to be something you you, you say, oh well shoot. I'm, are we going to church this weekend? It, sh it should be, like, like last weekend, I was not here. I was out of town. I was playing in a softball tournament, but I went to church after the tournament. I mean, there's services everywhere, all kinds of hours and, and stuff like that, because I needed to get my Jesus, feed my Jesus spirit, amen? Feed the Lord into me. So a anyway, uh, what I'm trying to encourage you to do is that we got to develop this passion. And these are how you, how you feed it and go on. Now I want to talk about work. If you don't 
if you're not enthusiastic about your job, you are working in the wrong job and you need to get another job or you're hanging around the wrong people. Why is it we get a job and we're telling everybody, praise God, I got a job, I got that job I was praying about, thank you for praying with me, praise God, it's a great job, I love my job, I, everybody, I got a job, and then I start hanging out with you, <laughs> who hates her job, and tells me every day, I hate this place, and I don't like this place, and, and, and all of a sudden, she pours water on my fire, and all of a sudden, I hate my job, and I'm miserable, you work at your job, if you work 40 hours a week, that's 2,080 hours a year plus the time driving there and back and lunch that you're involved with your job, it should be a time of enthusiasm. An enthusiastic employee goes places. They get promotions. They become the boss. Are you with me? They become the company owner. There's, a young, there's some young contractors in our church here, and I was talking to one of them, Paul, and he was just telling me, you know, I remember when he, he, he just worked for somebody else, and, and, but he had an enthusiasm for it, what he did. He, he builds uh, garage, uh, garage uh, cabinets, and plus he does a lot of other stuff, but he builds garage cabinets. If you need any garage cabinets, he's the guy to see. But anyway, this year he decided, I'm going to get my contractor's license because he loves his work, and he's very good at it. He's done work for me, and uh, uh, he... He said, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get my contractor's license. He went and got it. Now, I'm going to tell you, you're not going to get your contractor's license unless you have a passion because it takes study and it takes work and it takes labor. Are you with me? But he got his license. He told me today, he came in today, him and his wife, and he says, you know, guess what, Pastor? We just hired our first employee. He had told me a few day, weeks ago, I am so busy. I just can't keep up. I got so much work. Now he's hired his first employee I'm, I'm going to tell you, he is going somewhere because he's excited, he's passionate for what he does for a living. And you can be too. You can get excited about what you do. If you work a job you just hate, then find a job you love. You're going to have to feed the fire though. You may have to get some education like he did. You may have to learn from some other people. Start hanging around those people at work who love their jobs. And get away from those who are always complaining. Because they're only going to take you down. Amen? you got to build a fire. We need a fire built up in our relationships. Amen? You know, when we first get married, I have yet to marry a couple that goes, Oh, God, I gotta, I'm going to marry you, all right. No, no, they're like, ah. You know, it's like they're, we, we had a, uh, a wedding here Friday night. And I was... I was watching it online. I was watching it online. I watched the whole thing online. And, and oh, my gosh. You guys were, you were intoxicated with love. I mean, intoxicated. You're like, oh. <laughs> and uh, and I, I thought it was so cool. I, I, I started, I was actually at the Passion for Purity. And I'm watching you as they're talking and I'm watching the thing. It was awesome. But you know what? That passion ain't going to last unless you keep feeding it. You got to keep feeding it. You got to keep feeding it. When I got married to Tammy, I'll tell you, I would get off work. I'd be tired, but I would drive all the way over to her mom's house, a long way, many miles away from my house. And I'd drive there, and I'd stay there until it was so late, and her mom was flat kicking us out, kicking me out. And... Uh, then I'd drive all the way back to my house and have to get up super early and go to work. And I just wasn't getting hardly any rest. But I'll tell you, I was passionate for her. But we hadn't been married too long. And I began to pour water on the fire. I began to criticize her cooking. Well, that's not how mom makes pancakes. <laughs> that's a good way not to get any pancakes. <laughs> I began to criticize her here. I began to complain about stuff. And before you knew it, she couldn't stand to be around me, and I couldn't stand to be around her. But we knew that it's the will of God to stay together. So we're trying to figure this thing out. We're Christians. We're believers. And so in the process of this, we began to read and go get marriage counseling and go to some marriage conferences. But she brings me a book to read. Now, I'm going to tell you something, guys. If your wife ever hands you a book to read, 
you best read that book twice. <laughs> but she handed me this book, and I thought, it was by a guy named Kevin Lehman, and uh, I thought, well, I already know this. I, uh, honestly, that was the first thought in my mind. I, I thought, finally, you're getting it. <laughs> you're the one who didn't get it. Did you read it? And the title of the book was Sex Begins in the Kitchen. Well, I thought, whoa, this is a whole new world here. I don't need to read this book. I know how to do this. We're going to start here and end up over there. Amen. This is okay. I'm all in. But I found out that what this book was talking about, that if I wanted her to feel romantic, it had nothing to do with buying her lingerie. I thought, that's, you're going to be romantic. I'll go down and buy you some lingerie. and that'll. Anyway, I didn't know nothing. So I began to read this book, and it began to say that, you know, for her to get excited and passionate for you, you've got to help her fix dinner, guys. Oh, the guys are hating me right now. You've got to help her fix dinner. <laughs> False doctrine up there. No, it's spending time with her. It's spinning, it's just, if nothing else, just standing in the kitchen and talking to her as she makes dinner. Not telling her what she needs to do, but just talking, spending time together. It, it, it's like, help her clean up after dinner. Pick up some, quit expecting her to be your servant. Pick up some dishes and help clean them out. I was listening to a program yesterday, and they were talking about that most men do very little to help in the domestic arena. And that those who do typically only do it about 40%, not 50-50. And they were saying the best relationships, the guys do more in that domestic arena. You know, why is it that we expect moms to go off and raise our children and to work a job and to clean the house and to fix dinner and to do the dishes while we sit around. Oh, it's good preaching, guys. Good preaching. Because when you do that, you cause your wife, that's, that's like what does, gets her excited, amen? Now, for me, all she has to do is smile. Or I have to catch her you know, ah! you know it's, it's, it's really easy. Guys, just, it's just, just like a light switch. Whoa, okay. You know, but with women, it takes time and caressing. And, you know, it's, it's a romantic thing. So I began to learn that out of that book. I began to read other books. I even bought a book on my own on how to be romantic. I bought it myself. I saw how to be romantic. And I, I was in a bookstore, and I saw it, and I started thumping through it and said, man, these are some great ideas. I had no idea. I thought being romantic was going down to Victoria's Secrets and getting her something for her birthday. <laughs> God help me. It's going down fast. But, it, but anyway, but anyway, <laughs> I didn't really do that. <laughs> oh, man, save me. But, it, but anyway... But anyway, the thing is, the thing is, I began to realize that it's little things like going for a walk with her and talking. See, for you guys to build your relationship and reignite it and get it on fire again, it doesn't cost a lot of money. You don't need to go to a fancy restaurant and spend a lot of money. You don't even need to go to a movie. The only, all, only thing you need to do is just make a lunch and maybe go for a hike. Or maybe go down to the park. Maybe take the dog for a walk or whatever, the cat or whatever. I, I, I don't think you can walk cats, but you can hurt them. And, uh, but whatever the case may be, it's just spending some time. Going down to Tempe Lakes and just walking around. Just doing some window shopping, amen? It's just about taking an interest. And when you do that, you feed the fire. Now, I want to talk about a hobby or a sport or anything like that because I think every single one of us needs something outside of God, outside of our relationships. We need something we do that we enjoy, that you just have fun. My, my wife's fun thing is she likes to craft. She does crafting, all kinds of different crafting. And right now she's into scrapping. Any scrappers here? 
No, my wife's the only one. And I mean, she scraps. My wife is really good. She even has a ro her room she calls the scrap room. I call it the scrap shop because it could be a business. There's so much stuff in there. But anyway, she's got everything you can imagine, and she does some wonderful stuff in making these scrapbooks, just incredible stuff she does. That's her hobby. That's something she's passionate about. But, you know, when we're in school, we, we're taught different sports, or we're taught music, or we're taught to sing, or we, they get us involved in extracurricular activities, and you've got to find your passion. You know, professional athletes, they all have one thing in common. They're passionate about their sport. And because of their passion, they make lots of money. It's not necessarily they were the most skilled, but they were very passionate. And so that's what, like, I look at this kid here, and I think, man, this guy is passionate for basketball. You know who that reminds me of? Noah Penn. <laughs> Noah Penn. Michael Penn, our uh, worship leader. You know, My Michael, I, he's here someplace. Right there. So I, I saw that picture and I thought of Noah because, you know, his dad wants him to be a musician and he's got him a drum set and at an early age he's playing the drums and teaching him guitar and all this kind of stuff. But he found basketball at school and he, forget the drums, forget that. I don't, uh, he may go back to it one day, but right now he's into basketball, amen? So that's great. He's found a passion. We need a passion. What is your passion? What were you passionate about back in high school? What did you used to have a passion for? We need that to enjoy life. We need to have a reason to live life. Amen? Uh, I'm passionate about softball. That's kind of my hobby is softball. And uh, this is a picture of me last, last Sunday uh, and Saturday. We played up in Tucson at the Cinco de Mayo uh, tournament. And it's a big tournament. Teams come from all over uh, the country and play there and and they have eight fields going on simultaneously with teams playing. And uh, I was on an incredibly great team. This team was so good. It's probably, I, I play a lot of softball, about well over 100 games a year, up to 130 games a year. So I play a lot of softball. I play in a lot of different teams. I'm, I'm really into this sport. This is like what I do for my recreation time. I'm passionate about it. I practice and so forth and so on. But I happen to get on this team. And I know those guys all look old to you, but we're playing old guys. So when you're, when you're old and you play old guys, it's all cool. Yeah. But I'm going to tell you, that team right there probably could beat any team you've played on. I mean, they were good. Matter of fact, we, we got bumped out of our division because we game ruled four teams in a row. And they bumped us up to a higher division, and we just rolled over the top of them, too. In, in that time we were there, in the, in the whole time we were there, our batting average as a team was 754. Now, for those of you who know about batting averages, that's unheard of. Maybe one guy might be up that high, but the whole team averaging at that, that's just it. We scored 110 runs. We were playing 21 innings a day. So we were playing some baseball, amen, or some softball. That's me batting right there. Now, you notice you got to get your beard just turning just right. If you don't get that beard moving when you come around, <laughs> that ball ain't going anywhere, amen. <laughs> but we all need a passion. One thing my wife used to be passionate about, she still is. She, she exercises. She goes to the gym on a regular basis, and um, I don't go with her. I used to go with her. I used to work out with my wife, and we did this for years. For about five years, my wife was into exercising as much as anybody you know. Matter of fact, she was the Arizona State Champion bodybuilder at age 50. She's got trophies everywhere. She, she used to... Um, compete against these girls in their early 30s and stuff, she beat them all. I'm talking she was buff beyond buff. And I was Puff the Magic Dragon, she was buff. And, uh, but anyway, she, she'd go and she'd work out at least four times a week, sometimes five times a week, 
about three hours at a workout, two hours at a workout, and she would get her heart rate up anywhere from 135 to 165. Now, me, at 120, I'm going, I'm dying, help, help, you know. But she was really incredible. Her working weight for her legs on the leg press was 850 pounds. 850 pounds. That was her working weight. That wasn't her max weight. That was what she did sets at. So she was incredibly strong and really looked really good and everything. She had a real passion for that. Then we decided we're going to raise our grandkids, and that passion was shifted to our grandkids. Amen? I want to show you another picture because music can be quite profitable. About everybody here knows who that guy is. What's that guy's name? Slash. Slash. What's his real name? (laughs) Sal Hudson. Now, Saul Hudson in high school played the guitar, but he, had, he wasn't just like any. I played the guitar when I was in high school, junior high. You didn't know that, did you? That's how come I can look at it and see if you're doing a good job. <laughs> but I played the guitar. I, I took lessons for a year and a half, and I even got a picture in a minute I'm going to show you of me playing the guitar. And, uh, but I didn't have a passion for it. It was like... I, I need to practice. My mom would say, you, you go practice. you got to practice. I would like, oh, shoot, i got to go to guitar lessons. I never had a passion for it, so it never went anywhere. Are you with me? But this guy had a passion for it. And anybody know the group Guns N' Roses? Yeah, he's, he's the guitar, lead guitarist in Guns N' Roses. This guy's worth $32 million. He has four homes, multi-million dollar homes, That would blow your mind. But you know what? The reason he has that money is because he had a passion to play the guitar. It wasn't because he's raised in a wealthy family. He's in a very uh, poor family. He he was in a blended family. Uh, There was all kinds of reasons for this guy not to go anywhere, but he found his passion and he went with it. That's what I'm talking about. Here's a picture of me. That's my mom. Mom, stand up. It's Mother's Day. She was taller back those days. And uh, that's me sitting there playing the guitar. And we're doing it at Christmas time, 1969. And she's singing and I'm playing Kumbaya. <laughs> uh, that's the only song I ever learned. But, but anyway, in Colossians it tells us, whatever you do, it doesn't matter what you do, but whatever you do, work heartily as for the Lord and not for men. When you go to your job, you need to give it all. It's not about your company. It's not about so much about others. It's all about, I'm doing this for God, so I'm absolutely going to do the best job possible. Amen? You be the best employee. Don't hang around all the mully grubbing and all the complaining and naysayers. Get away from those people. Get around the people that are positive about their job. Amen? And if you can't find anything positive about your job, then get a job you love. Amen. Get some. I used to be a heavy equipment operator. Anybody run heavy equipment here? Anybody? Let me see. Nobody. If you who should raise your hands, I need somebody that can relate to this. But if you run heavy equipment, if you like playing with trucks when you were a kid. You're playing with trucks and loaders and excavators and, and you're really moving dirt and it's, it's like you get to go to work and play. It's fun. I used to love that job. I, I loved I used to be a commercial pilot. I loved that job. I was passionate about it because I got to fly. So there's all kinds of things you can do. Amen? All kinds of things you need to do. Sometimes we need to rekindle that fire. It's, it's gone out. We need to rekindle it. And it can be rekindled. It can, but you got to start feeding the fire. you got to get that, that passion going again. you got to stop the criticism. Criticism is water from the devil to put out God's passion in your life. The moment you, see, the moment you start criticizing or complaining, you are using the devil's water on your fire. 
you got to stop that. you got to stop complaining. you got to start proclaiming life. Amen? Amen? Say something good about your spouse. It's easy to say something bad. I could sit here and tell you for hours all the negative stuff I think about my wife. For hours. It, I've been married 42 years, buddy. I got a lot of negative. But I don't dwell on the negative. I dwell on the positive. You know, I, th I, th I think about the good things. And you know something? I think about my wife all day long, all day long. I think about her, think about her. This morning, she, she's right now up with her mom and Prescott and, and with her two uh, siblings, and they're celebrating Mother's Day up there. But I called her early this morning, and she didn't answer, but I left a voicemail and says, I'm just thinking about you. I love you so much. You mean so much to me, and I just hope you have a blessed Mother's Day. And tell your mom I respect her so much. You know, it, it, I appreciate my wife. Everybody has negative. We can focus in on that negative, or we can focus in on the positive. If you want that kind of relationship, that's built upon negativity. Fault finding. Blaming. But if you want a great relationship, I'll, I'll show you here. You see this girl right there? Now, when she found that guy, it just got all passionate. <laughs> I put that up. That's not the same girl, you know, but I put that up, and somebody last night says, is that the same girl? <laughs> messed my whole message up. I was messed up. <laughs> but anyway, I, I had to show you that. I got a big laugh out of that. Uh. <laughs> But anyway, it's all about building a bigger fire and then keeping the fire going. you got to constantly feed the fire, the passion, constantly. How do you feed the passion? By the words you speak, by the things I'm saying. I'm speaking life, not death. You guys are going to have a wonderful life together. You always talk about the good things of one another. Amen? Amen? Amen. Praise God. You will. You'll have a wonder. Look, look at this couple here. I mean, they've been married for a while now, and, he, and they... Give them a little room over here, you know. They're, they're, <laughs> I mean, they have a passion in their relationship. Now, this couple over here, they got their son in between them. I just don't know what's going on there. <laughs> yeah, well, they, uh, you're very passionate about, he bought, you know what he bought his mom for Mother's Day? Oh, I'm saying... I'm saying, he bought his mom a 52-inch smart TV. 55, pardon me. I've been wanting him to be my son, but... <laughs> but he, you know, he's got a great job, and he's, he's a journalist, and he's, he's just really going someplace in life, and... So if you have a problem with reporters, he's the guy to talk to. Uh, <laughs> but, it, but anyway, it, it's, it's about words. It's about pictures. If you want to, when I learned to fly, flying is very difficult. It's not like, it's not like a lot of things. It's hard. It's, it's not like getting a driver's license. It's very difficult. And you have to take three tests for every license you get. And you have to have multiple tests. To be a commercial pilot, you've got to get your private pilot's license and take three tests. A written test of 100 questions, then an oral test, then you have to do a flight test. To be a commercial pilot, you've got to do the same. Th then an instrument pilot, then a multi-engine pilot, and then a CFI, then a double I, then an ATF, and then you can get a job flying in an airline. It's lots of hard work. And I remember going to flight school and just getting discouraged and thinking, I don't like this. This is too hard. I want to go back and work in the rock quarries where I come from. And, and, but you know what? I hung in there because I began to look at pictures and begin to read Flying Magazine and Pilot Magazine. I got a job just cleaning the aircraft to make a little money, extra money in college. And that just being around those planes, uh, planes gave me a passion for flying. And the next thing you know, my first job I got paid for flying, they didn't have any openings. I got a job as the janitor, minimum wage. 
Minimum wage, I think it was $2.75 an hour. Now we're up to almost 12 come January. But anyway, that's what I, I was the janitor. But I did it as unto the Lord. I wasn't saved yet, but I did my best possible job. And the first slot they got open, they gave me a job as a pilot. He put me through the training. And my starting pay, get a load of this. This is in 1975, my starting pay was $30 an hour. Now they make a lot more today. A lot more. But it was all about getting a passion. Are you with me? You, you've got to read. Did you hear what I said? If you want to go someplace, I was listening to a thing. I was in Crystal's. Uh, my, she does my beard. She's in the first service. And, uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, I have, a, I have a hairdresser. You've got a beard like this, and you, you, guys, you can't do it on your own. You're always saying, you've got to get a hairdresser. Anyway, but uh, I was in there, and I, the radio was on, and it said, the, the guy was saying, did you realize that people's amount of reading is directly linked to their amount of income? And I said, I know, that's true. That's absolutely true. Now, some of us say, well, I don't like to read. How many here don't like to read? Come on, be honest. Raise your hand. That's the most of us. You don't have to read nowadays. You just watch YouTube. Just watch instructional videos about what you want to learn to do. You can learn to do anything. You can learn to be a mechanic. You can learn to be a carpenter. You can learn to be a plumber. You can learn to be a seamstress. You can learn anything on YouTube. There's audio books. But, but here's the thing. You can't spend all your time on YouTube watching the Russian car wrecks. I see several of you like it. I, I, I like them too. So you got to spend time, and you got to have fun. You got to have fun if you're going to have a passion. You know what a good marriage is built around? You guys have fun together. You just have fun. As long as you keep fun in the in the ingredients of your relationship, have fun serving God. Amen. Well, let's bow our heads. As our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, we've been talking about passion, having a passion. Something that fuels your relationship with God. A passion for life. Loving life, enjoying life, living life to its fullest. And how that all comes about. It's about a fire. But I can tell you, it all begins living the abundant life. is when you invite Jesus Christ into your heart to be your Lord and Savior. He came to give us life. And life abundant. And I want to challenge you here. If you're under the sound of my voice, maybe you're watching online. I want to challenge you. If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior, you ought to do it today. Light the fire today. Light the fire. I've set it up. I've put all the kindling and all the ingredients and a little bit of inner tube in there. And all you got to do is invite Christ to come in your heart. All that fire is going to take off. Because he's real. You'll feel his Holy Spirit come into your life today. You'll feel the presence of God. And so as our heads are bowed and our eyes are closed, if you want to receive Christ today as your Lord and Savior, raise your hand up to God. Let him see your hand. Let him see your hand. God sees that hand and that hand and that hand and that hand and that hand, that hand, that hand there, that hand there, that hand, hands all over. If you're watching this online, wherever you're at, raise your hand right now. Because it's between you and God. God will see your hand. Now I want to lead you in a prayer. And just pray this prayer after me with passion. And God's going to touch your life today. Matter of fact, I'm going to ask everybody to join in with this prayer and support those who raise their hand. Say this word with me. Say, Heavenly Father, I invite Jesus Christ to come into my heart and be my Lord and Savior. To forgive me for the mistakes I've made in my life. The sins I have committed. Holy Spirit, fill me with your presence. Create within me a fire, a passion that begins to burn for you. Help me to reignite this fire that's gone out and begin to fuel it every day so it grows and it grows and it grows. Help me in having a passion for my job, for my relationships, 
for life, period. That I'll love life. I'll enjoy life. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's give the Lord a big round of applause and thank God.